30 minutes from where my, my parents live. So I actually get to stay with my family while I get to work with a new client. Very good. Sounds like fun. Yeah. How about your weekend? Uh, just flying back to, to Denver from a, a kid's, a kid's basketball tournament. So, um, it should be a, should be a fun time. Yeah. Yeah. So we are, um, again, we're live on, on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, anyone watching, um, those of you watching, please feel free to submit questions here as we're, as we're having the discussion, really look forward to any, any, um, comments or topics you want to cover today. Uh, my name is Eric Kimberling. I'm here with uh, Brian LaCaruba and we'll, we'll go ahead and, and uh, get started today. So um, today's topic that we're going to cover is software evaluation. Uh, we're going to we're going to be talking about how to uh, evaluate um, software and what some of those those best practices are. And uh, we're going to we'll cover that here with uh, Brian LaCaruba, Caruba, who we have on the show here today. Um, so, Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric. Happy to be a uh, part of this today and to talk about software selections. Yeah, this is fun stuff. Something that you and I both have done quite a bit of over the years and excited to sort of get your take on some of the lessons you've had and uh, some of the recent experiences and past experiences with, with our clients. Um, before we jump into talking about software evaluation and how to select the right software for your organization, whether it's ERP software, CRM, human capital management, supply chain management, uh, e-commerce, whatever sort of technology you might be evaluating or selecting for your organization, um, which is the main topic we'll, we'll get to today. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about your background, Brian. Sure thing, Eric. So uh, I, Brian Lock Ruba, Manager of Strategy and Transformation at Third Stage. And I have been, over the last 15 years, really just worked a range of different roles uh, and the kind of different sides of the equation and different uh, big technology projects. So I, it really I came to it through a process improvement background. I got a black belt uh, Six Sigma and did a lot of varying uh, process improvement activities, worked with business process management systems quite a bit, uh, and then got involved in project management on major technology initiatives. And I've been on the side of the, uh, on basically kind of the vendor side of uh, implementing technology as well as on the client side. And I've um, really just done a range of different roles, some pretty technical, although I'm not definitely not a pure tech uh, technologist myself, but uh, I've been pretty involved with the technology teams, and uh, but o always with that stream of process improvement, project management, those things through, sort of weave throughout it, as well as uh, business intelligence, which was my concentration uh, in grad school when I got my master's. And uh, really over, over the time uh, for coming to third stage, I did a lot of uh, selections in, in uh, various technologies, including business process management and um, ECM content management systems, work with CRM systems, as well as, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of them in the ERP space and done them for uh, a range of different size clients. I really like working uh, with uh, just a variety of industries, whether they're heavy manufacturers or ones who just need financials, or ranging from billion dollar organizations to one I recently did working with a, a client who's got nine staff total. Um, so just really like working with that range of different organizations and different sectors and uh, bringing that to bear throughout the selection process. Nice. Good deal. So pretty, pretty broad background and uh, a lot of different experiences that you, you bring to the table here. So excited to dive into it. Well, uh, and as we're getting into the questions here, and like I said, anyone listening here live, feel free to chime in with questions or topics you want to cover. Um, and also, if you don't mind, maybe uh, just chime in and let us know where you're listening in from today. I'd love to hear where the audience is and uh, just get a feel from where everyone is. So maybe just put in the chat box where you're from. That would be uh, help help us understand the audience a little bit better here today. Um, so just jumping in here and, and maybe setting the context for for the discussion here today. Um, let's start with you know talking about the software evaluation process in general and why is it so important? If we just sort of back up and um, think about just software evaluation and selection, why is that process so important to organizations that are about to go through some sort of transformation? Yeah, I view it as kind of a two-part answer, Eric. And, and the first is kind of the obvious answer of which there's a lot of different software out there and navigating through the available software packages and uh, types of technologies is really important to be able to set the organization on the right path. And um, there's there's so many options and they're changing uh, quickly all the time and vendors are making advances and acquiring companies and moving into different spaces. Of course, just being able to navigate that and get something that's the right fit. But uh, I, I think it's more important from another standpoint, which is that um, you can, 
you'll often have a lot of things that can work for you, a lot of different software systems. But the, the process itself and going through this evaluation before you pick the software is super important to drive alignment within the organization on what matters and to really look at what are the goals of what you're trying to achieve with the technology and making sure that you're Whatever you're getting, you're getting for the right reasons. And that's even more important than having the right tool. So you'll have a lot of things that can do things in a very effective way for you. But if your business, is, uh, business or your organization is not trying to change in that way that the software might drive you towards, it could, it could put you in a bad spot. So having that, having that alignment and dir common direction and getting those involved in the process to really draw out unstated assumptions and needs is critical. Yeah, that's a great point. So it's a it's more than just choosing the software then is, is what you're saying. It's also the sort of this secondary benefit, which is a really important one, which is getting aligned, getting on the same page and sort of defining what that vision is for the project. Yeah. Point. And then knowing once you once you have the tool and the vendor and the tech and the team in place you're gonna work with that they've been that that you've assessed them on the right basis. You know, we've we've worked with some clients who've gone through and They've picked a, they've picked a system based on what someone else recommended to them, or based on a very fast evaluation process. And then, as they just went through the implementation, just find that, um, yeah, maybe a great system, but it's not. These aren't the types of things we're trying to do. So, right, yeah, absolutely. And so, when you when you look at the evaluation process, um, in, in sort of, you know, with our client experience and in, in the examples or, or case studies of, of situations you've been in helping clients select the software. What have some of the biggest challenges been that, that you think organizations face when evaluating potential systems in the market? Hey, one of the one of the first ones to start with is even just knowing what categories of systems to look at. And I saw this was one of the blogs you just published in the last uh, few days, Eric. But around the difference, uh, knowing do we need an ERP system or a CRM or an HCM or a VPMS or looking across those different categories and even knowing where to start. How do you think about the foundation of what you're trying to do? Uh, being, being able to assess and, and know what's out there and what kind of things it's going to help enable you in, in changing. So uh, a lot of organizations, depending on how much you know, if you have a lot of people who have been around, you've been using a legacy system for a lot of years and your people have been using that system and they haven't been in a lot of other companies that use other technology, simply based on the frame of what do you use uh, today? How do I want that thing to work better as opposed to being able to have that broader look at what are some of the other capabilities we could be looking to do? What are some of the questions we need to ask that we're not asking? So uh, I think that's a big one. Another big one too is just being able to um, get a really clear and decisive picture from the vendors on the things that they need to know. You know, every vendor is uh, happy to put out any canned material or do a, a demo that they've done a thousand times that is done in the way they want. They show you all the things that look good in their product and all the ways that others might like it, but it doesn't necessarily, um, unless you have something that's really targeted in a process that draws out your key requirements and what you need to do to be able to, um, put those in front of the vendor in a way that really forces them to show you their, their product warts and all and with the things that may be harder for them to do is a, it's a key challenge. And yeah, those would be two of the big ones we see. Yeah, but that first one's pretty interesting. And I think it's a, it's one that it seems like a lot of organizations don't think about, which is, you know, that whole point about what kind of software are we really looking for? It mm -hmm. seems like a lot of organizations sort of dive into just an assumption that, hey, we're going to go find an ERP system or, um, you know, we're going to look at one myopic part of our business and look for, you know, warehouse management or e-commerce or whatever. And then our other organizations just don't know. And so I think it's really important to educate yourself on what those different systems are and recognizing that it all doesn't have to be the same system. You know, you might be looking at, you know, multiple systems. And I want to come back to that here in a few minutes, maybe we we'll talk about the whole best of breed versus mm -hmm. single ERP um, as we unpack this a little bit more. But um, in the meantime, though, before we get to that, what, what are some of the, when, when you think about the evaluation process and everything that goes into it, what do you think the most important parts of a, of a software selection are? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the first thing is to not start with the software. It's to start with your strategy and to start with your business processes. So really understand where are you trying to go as an organization? What are the changes you need to make? What do you expect to, see, to do over the next three to five years? What are your big challenges now? Uh, and make sure that is driving the direction in which you're trying to go. And then being able to really take that to the next the next step, which is to drill that down into understanding your current state business processes and 
uh, tying that back. You know, we always start when we do selections, we, we do a strategy workshop, but then the, the bulk of the, the starting point on it is a series of business process workshops where we, we drill in. And it's not even getting to extreme levels of depth on every process to select software. You don't need to know uh, every, every click, everything that everyone's doing at every step of the way, but you do need to have a good overall foundation of what are your, what are your end-to-end -end processes? How do they, big part is how do they connect? Uh, what are the handoffs? Uh, between different departments as you go, trying not to look at this just in your existing silos, uh, but looking at it from the standpoint of how does your business tie together uh, end to end and those different elements uh, connect. Mm -hmm. So that that's really the key of the foundation of it all. And once you have that, everything you're going to be looking at from a technology perspective is not based on just what is inherently the best system or the one that other people like, but it's going to be figuring out the one that's right for you. Yeah. Yeah. Makes total sense. And it's, it's easy to worry too much about what other companies are doing or, you know, what your peers are doing or whatever, without really thinking about, well, you know, what is it we need and focusing on those, those aspects of it. Um, yeah. And I want to add one more to that too, which is just from the, from the vendor perspective of, uh, and, and how you move the project, you know, vendors are, may have certain approaches of how they want to take it or tell you that it's going to fall along this step or that step, but you really want to be able to make sure you're driving this and at a pace that's, that's right for you. You don't want it to, um, drag out unnecessarily, but you also don't want to move it to some um, artificial timeline that someone else is setting. You want to be able to look at this and figure out the uh, the right steps to be able to um, move it uh, along effectively, do what you need to do to understand what your needs are and to be able to to drive the vendors to, to get you those answers uh, and to do it in a way that's giving the team the, uh, enough time to absorb without getting stuck in overanalyzing. Right. Yeah, makes total sense. So just to build on uh, my last question a little bit, this is actually a question from the audience, uh, from someone watching on YouTube. Uh, this is from Zishan on YouTube. He asks, uh, what is the importance of business requirement documentation before evaluation of software applications? Yeah, it's critically important. And although I'd say, uh, again, when we talk about when, when third stage gets involved in a project, that's the first step that we do in this. So we consider it a step of the evaluation as opposed to in a way something you're doing before. But you definitely do want to have a set of business requirements uh, that's really driving what you're looking at before you decide what systems you're going to bring into the picture. Uh, and sometimes there may be systems that are considered for various reasons. If you're part of a large organization and your parent company is using a certain system and there's a, it's a desire to get you on that, that's going to be on your list regardless of whether or not it's the right answer. You want to start considering it. Um, there may be an upgrade to your legacy system you'll consider as well. But th so there's, there's various considerations there, but you'll always want to, uh, really drive those requirements out first and get uh, get a good list of what it is you're looking for uh, and, and have that be the foundation of how you're looking at the systems you bring into the picture. Yeah. Yeah. And I always tell clients too that, you know, if you're, if you know, you're going to go through a ERP or digital transformation, whatever it is, whatever type of software you're, you're looking to deploy, you're going to have to define your requirements at some point, you know, mm -hmm. at the very least you would have to define them to build the software or to configure the software. So you might as well, get the benefit of that, of helping you evaluate and find the right software. So that alone, I think is a, is a you know, sort of a, an argument for defining those requirements up front and certainly, um, you know, just making sure you find the right software because there's so many different systems out there and so many different options, it's easy to find a mismatch, which can make it very difficult, if, if not impossible to, to implement effectively. Yeah, and, and sometimes there are unique requirements to you, kind of niche items that are really important to your organization that may not um, be, that may not be very common that you just have to get into enough detail to be able to get it. And again, you don't need to know every, every step of every operation, but sometimes there are really critical items that you just need a software to do. And if you don't, if you don't have those, those can, and it's not to say they other uh, systems won't have a way to work around that or to find a way to make it happen, but um, you really want to know what those key unique drivers are and, and now, that's a big part of it too, is being able to identify not just the things that you need, but what are the things you need that are uh, going to be out of the ordinary, a little bit harder for uh, or uh, other vendors to meet and trying to make sure that you're asking about those in the right way. Yeah. So how do you, just building on that a little bit, just as a follow-up, how do you um, balance the, how do you find that right balance of knowing how much detail to get into and how, you know, how exhaustive you want that requirements list to be uh, versus you know, you don't want to get in, caught up in analysis paralysis and have so many requirements that your head starts to spin and you can't really <laughs> differentiate the different options out there. How do you how do you find that right balance? Yeah, this is a 
from our perspective, you know, we try to take that. We we've got um, kind of some guidelines we look at when we when getting into workshops based on the size of organization, the number of people in the process to try to, and, and the way that we go about doing those of just lengths of time. And I don't want to throw numbers out here because it's kind of tied into the specifics of how we do it. But um, you know, we we do try to look at just getting through within. A reasonable period of time, you know, we're talking days or, or weeks, depending on the size of the organization, not spending months getting into processes of, um, or in some cases, it can be a day or less than a day, depending on a small organization, but re really just trying to um, make sure you're running through and you're getting that end to end. And as we facilitate those, we'll, we'll ask the questions that are helping uh, guide to um, tell me what you do. And, and as, as someone may drill into, hey, I've got this pain point. Well, tell me a little bit more about that, but may, maybe stop before someone may get into, well, these, this is all the all the things I have to do with this spreadsheet to move it around and to manipulate the data. Um, but we'll want to know kind of what are the key drivers to things like that. So it, it's a balance in trying to get through workshops. But one of the, the key principles we try to follow too is like, let, let's make sure we're at least getting that end to end picture. And then if there are areas we need to drill into, we've at least gotten enough of an understanding of that, that we can always come back to it and make sure to spend some more time uh, on it with maybe a little focused discussion on a certain topic. Yeah. Yeah. Makes, makes total sense. And it, you sort of triggered a, a follow-up question or it's, it leads into another question I had for you, which is, you know, you, you talk about um, buy-in, you know, just getting buy-in and sort of that, the organizational ownership of the decision, not that you necessarily need a unanimous agreement on, you know, what the priorities are, or what kind of software you're going to deploy, but it, it is, there is a, a something to be said for the buy-in that you get by involving different people and different stakeholders in the evaluation process, but sort of building on that thread and in, in, in looking to change management in general, how do you, how do we typically, and how do our teams with our clients typically address change management as part of the, evaluation process and, and why? Why are we thinking about change management this early in the, in the process when we haven't even picked the software yet? Yeah, I, I mean, there's there's two parts of how I look at the change management part of the conversation. The first, as you talked about, is just the, the process itself and tying to that first answer I gave at the top of this is the, um, the, the act of aligning and understanding what people's expectations are is a, is a big part of that. Um, and, and you wanna, a, a good way to think about this is, is if there's any potential conflict coming in this, if there's any ways in which people are pulling different directions, it's going to happen at some point. You want to draw that out as quickly as possible and and uh, figure that out up front and know if people are, are looking at things in a different way. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just people have different experiences and expectations. You want to be able to uh, capture that early and deal with it and deal with it before you make some of the big decisions and start setting expectations and budgets and things along those lines. So um, it's really important to go through that early. Um, it's actually one of the one of the clients I'm working with right now. We're having a lot of a lot of really great discussions. It's been taking a little longer on the selection, but it's been a good thing because it's been uh, helping draw out. It's a unique organization that does um, a number of different functions that don't normally get pulled together in one organization, even for a small organization. So we've been working through with them of uh, what are the expectations and still trying to work through to align around that. So it's an important thing to to do and and to help guide and understand what are the what are the areas you're going to need to support and. You know, so so the act itself of going through the evaluation is important from change management of, of just driving out those expectations. But we also like to use it as a starting point to even for those who aren't as deeply involved in the selection process uh, to to work with um, whether it's sending out a survey to the entire organization or doing some focus groups or just starting to get some communication out and to just get a pulse of where the organization stands and the people, you know, because the people who are making the, de the decisions will be uh, ideally involved and, and it's affected by their teams, but they're not necessarily ones who are working in the system as much day to day as some of the other people who are going to want to uh, make sure to know what are their pain points and challenges and what is their view on uh, what their past experience has been in the organization. So we often, one of our, our most common tools is starting with an organizational readiness assessment and a survey that goes out to people up front to help start gauging that and to start aligning our other activities around that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, that's an important point because I think so many organizations think, well, you know, we'll worry about change management later. We'll, we'll get to that once we figure out what the software is, then we'll figure out how we're going to train people or communicate or whatever. But there's so much more that, that should happen early on. And that's a whole nother, it's a whole nother thread or rabbit hole. We could go down and spend an, an easily an hour on that, just that topic alone. Yes. But it's a, it's a good point um, about, you know, sort of maybe scratching the tip of the iceberg here in the evaluation process for sure. Um, so we're getting a few other questions. It, it's funny, right before we, we went live, I, I know I was telling you, 
Brian, that uh, we don't get, we usually don't get many questions on YouTube for whatever reason, but today we're getting a ton of questions on YouTube. So um, just appreciate the, the, the engagement here. So another question uh, that I wanted to cover here is, are, are you setting goals and KPIs for a project to check the business value from the investment and how do you get to those metrics? Yeah, great, great question. That's one that we do. It can vary how we do that depending on the organization. That is something that's uh, beneficial to do up front. You are, some organizations, the, the level of maturity on this uh, of what data you actually have access to and how you can measure that is pretty limited to be able to do that up front. And um, so uh, we worked with another client. We had this discussion about KPIs and setting a business case up front. And we really came down to the answer of like, we can't give you any of those numbers. Let's just talk about what some of the things are that we should be measuring and look at those as goals of what we're going to try to do in this. Uh, in other cases, you may have organizations that have a lot of really good data and know that there's room for improvement in that, in which case then we are gonna, we are gonna look at those and start to set some uh, targets. We have, we have access to some benchmarking materials uh, we can use, uh, or uh, you know, if you have good connections within your industry, for example, there are a lot of industry trade groups sometimes where that type of information is shared to be able to understand, are you maybe keeping, taking longer to turn over your inventory or are you spending more on your overall IT staff than others are? And, those things may have good reasons that are tied to the way you do business, or they may be things that are just because they haven't got the level of focus and attention and looking at those numbers that need some areas and need some improvement. So, um, yeah, it's a really, it, it's a very valuable part of the process, I guess is the way I'd put it, but it's something if you don't want it to hold you up either, if you don't have good data to say, oh, we don't even know how to measure this. So maybe we can't proceed because it's not going to be worth the money. Like you, you can still, you can still find ways to identify what the benefits are going to be. And even if you can't quantify them as cleanly as you'd like to, to, to have a path forward. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a great point. I, I, I think the question is a great one too, because so many organizations, especially nowadays with, with the transition to the cloud and how there's so many companies and organizations that are uh, for being forced, for lack of a better word, they're being forced or they have no choice but to move to a new system, either because uh, their old system is being sunset or, um, you know, they just want to be on a newer technology. There's just a lot of organizations that are making that leap and they're going to do it no matter what. And I think a lot of times companies fall into that pitfall of, um, hey, we don't need a business case because we, we know we're going to do it. We have no choice. So why build a business case? Why focus on business benefits? It's already been approved or whatever. So yeah, do you see that too, or is that a dynamic that we struggle with with some of our other clients? Yes, and in those cases, the business case can be more about, um, again, it's that, that word I've been using a lot, alignment, and making sure that the direction of what you're trying to achieve with it is clear. So as you go forward and you have to make decisions, those are tied to where you expect to see benefits. So that business case doesn't necessarily need to be something you put in front of the board and you can justify to a specific rate of return of what you're gonna be getting out of this project, but you do want it to be something that um, when you come to a crucial point in the project and you find some some capability that's gonna require maybe a change in process or something to be done differently than you were anticipating or that you may have to just make a trade off of one choice or another around something that, you know, how are you gonna make that decision? What's gonna be the driver of what that's going towards? So the business case can be a really important tool to help you understand, oh, this is, let's remember that we decided together that these were the most important benefits we're hoping to gain out of this project and that that can drive that decision. Because sometimes it may not be the most clear financial one. It might be that it's something that's gonna really uh, support uh, something that your customers desire, but that you can't quantify, or it's something that your employees really need. And the, the morale um, hit from not being able to improve this one really painful process for them could be really, really bad. And that's something you want to address. So there's um, a lot of different factors that can go into it. Yeah, it's a great point. It's almost like a, I, I almost view business cases as a, not just a justification tool. It's also, you know, benefits realization tool to, that helps you you know, sort of optimize and measure what results you actually get to your point. But it's also, I think you're alluding to the fact that it's also a, a project governance tool during the implementation. So you use it as a way to get those decisions, like you were saying, and, you know, good examples, you know, someone within the organization, it happens probably 99% of the time, 99% of the implementations we're involved with, you get someone in the organization that wants to customize the software. They, they find something they don't like about it or that they feel like should be customized to make it a better fit. And a lot of times you're sort of flying blind or shooting in the dark trying to make that decision of, well, you know, we have zero customization policy, so no, we're not going to do it. You know, that's a lot of the mindset that you hear. Or you get the other extreme where companies are just customizing to death and it's it's creating a lot of risk and problems. Most organizations, you know, struggle to find that balance. Like, and this is just one example, by the way, this whole thing, but um, that's just an example of how to have a business case that can be sort of your, 
your guiding light or whatever you want to call it that allows you to make decision in the context of what how's going to help us and what kind of ROI are we going to get from you know from the if we do or don't make that decision. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. The customization piece too is one that, uh, you know, it's pretty common organizations will go in with, you know, we want to limit customizations, but um, the, there's, all, you're right, there's always going to be questions coming up of, well, should we customize here or not? And how do you think about that? And how do you, um, I don't even necessarily want to say put some teeth behind the, the limiting customization, but you at least need to be able to have some kind of uh, process that people can be comfortable in of where you're making those decisions. And if you have to tell someone, no, you have to live with some of what this may seem like a limitation to you that you have a good uh, mechanism for being able to make that decision in a fair way. And then to, and in some cases you may choose not to do it because it's actually not better for the organization because that customization would be entrenching a bad practice that just happens to be the way you do it now. But in some cases it might be an improvement. It's just not worth the long-term maintenance and, and risk uh, that gets incurred from doing the customization. Yeah. 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 And, and having that business case will help you help you come to that conclusion or come to whatever conclusion makes makes sense for your organization. Um, so another question here from YouTube um, is what and it, it actually say uh, shifting gears a little bit to look at not just the software. And so maybe just back up before I get to this question, there's there's really two major components of a software evaluation, or at least there should be. There's the software itself and then there's the, the implementation, you know, assessing, you know, you assess the level fit of the software and then you assess the implementation cost and what that's going to look like and all that good stuff. So when we think about implementations and that aspect of a software evaluation, um, how, how does that maybe tell us a little bit about how that works? You know, how do we go through that process with, uh, with the implementation of evaluation? And then I'll get to the, the real question that the person had uh, on YouTube as well. Yeah. So there's, this is, uh, you know, and just all the things we've talked about, requirements and uh, everything else are kind of evolving throughout into different levels of detail. So as you look at the implementation, you know, you're going to start, you will you may have some baseline of expectation of what we hear just from initial conversations. And then you send out an RFP to vendors, they're going to give you back something with an expectation. This is what's going to cost. This is how much customization. This is uh, the timeline it's going to be. And all, all of those are, uh, they're guesses. They're, they're going to be grounded in some reality, usually, if a but, but, you know, the vendors taking that in good faith, which they most of the time are going to be doing it. You're going to be having something that's somewhat based in reality, but you you also need to, um, that, that'll get uh, honed in on quite a bit more as you go through. And there are a lot of assumptions that are just built into that we have to look at. Part of it is what are the, what's the level of effort and expectation from the client team to be able to uh, engage in that process? You know, if, the, if an S if an estimate is based on the fact of you're going to have, you know, 10 people full time devoted to this project and there's not no plans to backfill and to put people into that and people may be allocated a significant amount less. That's going to affect the way we look at the implementation, depending on how the vendor does it. It could have a significant impact on costs. If that's the case, um, you've got to look at the complexity of the different modules that are part of it. You know, and again, an RFP is going to come back and a, a responsive proposal with, um, some degree of clarity on that, but that'll get honed in on a lot more as you go through demos and vet out are each of these uh, modules uh, capable as needed and where is it going to fit in with the existing technology environment. So that's the other really big part of this too is you're likely going to have some integrations to other systems. So you really have to account for what are those uh, going to be factored in, who's going to do them. So you know, a big theme in it is looking at your internal impact on it because another area too and sorry i'm kind of going on with a bunch of different areas here for you to <laughs> respond to eric but uh, data is another big piece of this in the implementation and that's generally the vendors aren't taking responsibility for that the vendors will give you templates to load into their system they're going to help you with um, actually getting those loaded into the system in a lot of cases but you're going to be responsible for pulling your data and validating it and ensuring that it's right and cleansed and that can be a really big effort on top of it. So there, there's tasks that you as a project team are going to need to uh, take and own and make sure that you can commit to those things in it as well. So you know, those are all just a bunch of pieces that factor into how we look at the implementation and, and you know, we keep working through those. And we want to make sure even though you'll keep learning more as you get into the implementation, you want to make sure by the time you're ready to sign a statement of work that you have a, uh, a handle on all of these uh, to, uh, to a certain degree to be able to, to plan around it and feel confident and um, that you've right sized the project. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Great, great points there. I mean, there's so much to think about. And I think, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, I agree with you that 
the implementation partners, whether it's a reseller, the software vendor themselves, or a system integrator, um, they they tend to uh, do these estimates generally in good faith. But I think the challenge is they don't know what they don't know, first of all. Um, second of all, so much of what causes delay and so much of the effort that goes into a project is actually the stuff that happens outside the scope of what a, what a software vendor or implementer would do. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned data as an example. We talked about change management. Those are two examples of things that those two things are usually not done or they're not done well by most system integrators or, or implementers. But those are the things that will determine how successful your project is or isn't. It also determines how long your project is going to take and largely determines how much it's going to cost. So when you're, it's not just a matter of evaluating that piece, you know, the vendor's piece or the, the implementer's piece of the implementation. You also have to look at sort of the, the overall scenario. You know, what does the overall implementation timeline look like? And does it make sense for your organization? Even if the vendor thinks it makes sense, ultimately you, you sort of have to sanitize it or rationalize it for your organization. Yeah. And um, recognizing how do you need to support the change and what does that uh, timeline need to look like for your people? You know, one of, the, one of the clients I'm working with now is a public sector client. I'm involved in supporting their implementation and doing a lot of change management work with them. And they've got a timeline that's probably twice what a similar level of functionality might be for uh, a similar business, even though, of course, they're doing things that are um, things like public works and whatnot that aren't necessarily corollary to what you might see in a business. But um, it's just uh, important from the perspective of how they work with things to be able to uh, really give give the time to it's very hands on with the vendor to to work with them. They are the vendor is working with them in this case on data, uh, on, on documenting the procedures and, and um, building out a lot of the processes throughout workshops and then we're going to have multiple rounds of uh, continued workshops as they go through this uh, process because that's what they're going to need to be able to get everyone comfortable with the solution and, and to build that in. So, uh, and in this case, we had a different vendor who was a finalist proposed a, a much shorter timeline, which wasn't a, a wrong proposal. They could have done it in that time, but, um, and we could have worked with them to extend that. So it wasn't as if it, you know, it, it was wrong. It was just uh, in the end, that the timeline we needed to go with was one that allowed for the, much more of that time to be able to uh, give everyone across all the departments the opportunity they're going to need. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, along those same lines, it's, you know, that that internal decision making and sort of the internal dynamics that can drive the duration up and down depending on, you know, what those dynamics are. Um, you know, the other aspect of this is a lot of times we find that the implementation duration and the implementation itself is oftentimes affected by how well you prepare for it and all the stuff you do up front. So if you we find that ironically that the people that just jump right in and start implementing right away when they've selected the software, they tend to take longer just because it, it's so messy. Right. You know, you just get so much, you mentioned alignment before or misalignment. They're just, the team's not aligned yet. Even though we've gone through this evaluation exercise, you still have a lot more alignment to do to get on the same page and to get a foundation and a blueprint in place before you move forward with the implementation. But the vendors and implementation partners typically try to rush you, you know, because it, it's in their financial best interest to rush you or mm -hmm. for you to start sooner. So you end up, you know, a lot, a lot of companies end up jumping right in thinking that they're actually going faster when in fact they're, they're, they're going to end up slowing things down in, in a lot of ways. So that's the tricky part of that evaluation. I, I would think, uh, you know, as far as evaluating the implementation aspect of the, of the proposals that you get back. Yeah. And it, it's just being able to look at what are the risks specifically and how are those being dealt with to be able to build out the implementation plan? Yeah. So back to the, um, uh, person on, on YouTube here, um, it looks like Kumar on YouTube asked, what kind of contract should be written for ERP implementation projects? Um, so I'm not, I know you're not a legal expert, you're not a lawyer, but maybe just talk a, a little bit about how, you know, how how should the, you know, RFP or, or you know, maybe just dive in mm -hmm. a little bit more, what are some of the things you should be looking at, you know, as, as part of that, that process? Yeah, and thanks for starting with that disclaimer that I was gonna have to give anyway. So uh, definitely there are areas from, yeah, a, a legal perspective, you're going to want to have someone with that expertise to look at. But uh, there, there is a lot you can look at from the perspective of just operationally of what's getting included. So, I mean, scoping, scoping is huge. You know, again, when you get when you do an RFP, you're going to have some sense of that degree of scope, but uh, you're really going to have to use the process from RFP through demos and through building out a statement of work to be able to have a much clearer uh, sense of what's coming into that and making sure um, you know, you need to be comfortable that they, what they've defined in there is uh, what the vendor has defined as the scope that you've worked with them on that, that you fully understand it, that you have any questions they've been answered, uh, and that the process for any changes is one that you're very clear and comfortable with and understand 
I mean, that that's a big part of it. Of course, change orders, change control of some kind are uh, almost always going to come up. So you, you want to know uh, there's clarity in that. You want to know that um, are, are there you know, are there penalties for you if you're taking time to decide on something? How, to, how does the pace of the implementation and the approach towards it fit in with uh, how you're going to function as an organization? You know, some uh, some implementations are designed to really just uh, push you along and make sure even if either you make a decision quickly or you're going to keep uh, paying anyway. And that's something that may be fine and may be the discipline you need to, to keep pushing forward, but you have to be ready as an organization for something like that. You need to make sure you know all those other things I was talking about before, whether it's data or change management or anything like that. You're you're looking for the things that aren't in the agreement as well as what is. Are you being trained on um, your processes or just getting um, you know canned material about how the system works? And then you have to figure out how to build it into that. So knowing all of the things that you need to pick up as an organization is important. And then looking at things from a cost perspective uh, beyond just that first contract, you know, what what's the potential for annual increases after? Are those capped? Looking at things like uh, if you were to add additional users, if it's a user-based license cost, what is the process for that? What are the costs for that? Are those are those built in, or are you going to end up paying through the nose? I mean, a lot of vendors will will work with you on that. Sometimes you have to ask for it. Um, you if you do do something like a major acquisition that's probably not going to be planned for in your contract and that wouldn't be fair for the vendors to necessarily be able to commit to something that could fundamentally change your business to that scope but you can plan for the expected types of changes and build that into your contract right yeah makes makes sense it's good good advice um so another question here um and i'm not i'm still trying to digest it maybe between the two of us we can make sure we're hitting the mark on this but uh, the question is from Frederick on YouTube. He asks, um, I've often seen RFPs having three options on requirements, fit, customize, or no. With platform capabilities like Microsoft, uh, platform as a service, slash power platform, Infor, Ion, and other capabilities, how to respond, question mark. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that's an interesting question. As I look at, you know, we have standard RFP templates. We'll always adjust them to what the client needs and work in their requirements. But that, that's generally just of how we do the RFPs, and we have um, the vendors answer to those. But those answers often do have some gray areas um, that you have to address because because the term, if you just take the term, you know, customization, for example, is the way we put it on there. Does this require customization? Well, a customization can mean very different things in the way platforms have evolved now. In, in the old school uh, on-premise model, and I don't want to say there, there are good systems that can do it in that model now, but in, in let's say the way traditionally that's been done, if you have an on-premise system, you could say a customization is just some code you build on top of it to support this need, and you, you have that in your system, which can make it more difficult to upgrade but or not. But Sometimes it can mean something through a third party uh, that you you know you can go to some type of app store type experience to be able to get some enhanced functionality to add on to it. It could be different modules that have different costs associated, and you may just have to say, "Oh, I like the base package of in this software, but we need we need something more that's just an additional cost on top of it." Um, I mean, for, that's one of the things we do when we evaluate an RFP. We look through those answers and um, make sure that what we're getting from the vendors is something we feel is comfortable that they're answering it in the same way uh, that you know, the meaning of this one saying it is a third party and this one saying they're not is, is something that kind of means the same thing so that we're putting them on the same page. So uh, yeah, I don't know if I, if I answer that exactly, but just kind of that's my thought process on how we look at the different types of answers that can be given and, and what the software can do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the um, the tricky part of it, and I think this, this, gets to a follow-up question that that same person had that Frederick had on YouTube. He said, if it's not a customization, so in other words, it's something that the software can do without customization, should there be other options other than yes, no, you know, some, you know, low code, you know, mm -hmm. he, he gives an example of low code uh, types of need or BI bolt on some sort of integration, that sort of thing. So it's not, I think that's where it's, it gets tricky is it's it, the gray area that you mentioned. It's not just yes, no, because in most cases, you know, with most requirements with most vendors, you're going to get mostly yeses. You know, it's going to be a lot of yeses. And mm -hmm. I know we've had RFP responses from multiple vendors from the same client, same situation, um, where you get like 98, 98, or 98, 99 percent of the responses from all the vendors are like, yes, we can do that. But it's not a matter of yes, can they do it? It's it's how well do they do it? And I think that's that gray area you were talking about that, that can be difficult to navigate or to assess in those responses. 
Yeah, and, and third party is always one of the ones we put on there as well as an option. We want to know it, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing to use some kind of bolt on or whatever form of third party it's going to be, but it's something you want to make sure you're very clear on what those are. And then you can have discussions on the nature of that integration, what the costs are associated to that, who's going to implement it. Is that something that they may be recommending this one, but they don't support it at all? Or is it something like, oh, yeah, it's a partner we work with all the time. We can implement it for you, but we just have this additional license cost or how tightly integrated is it, those types of things. So we always want to want to know that, and make sure going into it that you're very clear on uh, what that what that differentiation is. So yeah, I, I we, we don't uh, tend to do them as fit or no fit as much as what's, what's the type of fit. Is it out of the box? Is it a configuration? Is it a customization? Is it a third party or, or that type of thing? Yeah, yeah. And you know, speaking of BI, and and uh, you know, we also talked about you mentioned data a little bit earlier too. So about data and BI, uh, how does how should business intelligence in general, you know, reporting, data analytics, business intelligence, sort of that whole bucket of stuff? How does that factor in, or should it factor into an evaluation process? Yeah, I mean, it needs to tie in from the standpoint of your strategy and where you're trying to go. And one of the big reasons for system implementations typically is going to be you need more reliable data that's more integrated uh, throughout. I think. Um, and whether that is all in one system or whether that's saying you need to have your disparate systems connected in a more clear way where your data, you have uh, a clear source uh, system of record for each piece of data and you know your single source of truth for whatever it is, even if uh, it could be uh, different for some, some aspects of your data may live in one system, some may live in another. You need to, you're, you're really trying to drive that out of this. So, um, understanding what your data needs are, what you're trying to drive from a business intelligence perspective. Are there often, we're going to hear in these when we do these strategy sessions, leaders saying things like, I, I want to be able to make a decision this way or get this type of report, but I can't, so I make do with something else. And uh, Or it could be people on, on the day-to-day uh, -day operations who have that same challenge. They're flying blind because they don't have the information that they need. So understanding those uh, needs of, of what you're trying to drive out from an information and decision-making perspective and aligning what you're trying to do uh, with that is, is really critical. So just, um, and, and then the tools themselves, you know, that that's another piece of it. Um, if we're looking at kind of a straight ERP project where everything you're trying to do is for the most part contained within that ERP system, you want to be evaluating from the perspective of how, how well does that system report and give you access to the data you need and make it easy for you to draw out other insights and build your own kind of custom reports out of it. But you may also have to look at, you know, we, you have a technology stack of other systems as well that need to play into this that are not going to go away and be in one system. So then you really have to be looking at how are we going to um, connect that data? Is it through um, do we have an existing BI tool or using something like a Tableau and you're aggregating all your data in other places and you want to be able to see that in one place or do you have some other means that you're trying to uh, pull that together? Um, it, so knowing kind of where you're starting from, where you're trying to get to from using having better data to make better uh, informed decisions is uh, a foundational element. Yeah. And it triggers another question that we, we sort of alluded to or danced around earlier. I, I punted it to later in the conversation. You think about BI, I mean, you could either look at, you could look at the BI capabilities of the core system that you're implementing, or you could be looking at standalone BI tools that mm -hmm. would integrate with whatever tool or tools you have or plan on deploying. So that begs the question of just in general, not just for business intelligence, but just looking across our enterprise technologies, how do we know, or, you know, how do you navigate that decision of, I want a single ERP system that can do everything, including business intelligence and warehouse management, financials and CRM, HCM, all that stuff. Or do I go with more of a best of breed model where I find multiple systems that can do you know more precisely what I want, and then I you know tie those together? How do you how do we help clients make that decision? Because that seems to be one of those philosophical debates that I don't think will ever end. I don't think will any any side will ever win that argument. But you know, different answers for different clients. So how do they how do we navigate that with our clients? Absolutely. Yeah, that's been one of the um, key pressing topics with a couple of my clients right now. And um, you could get you could get tied up around the axle in the infinite number of possibilities across those as well, because even I mean, we say acronyms like ERP and CRM and whatever, but there are blurred boundaries between those and systems that would fit all kinds of uh, other ways around those that, that they have some capabilities. We'll use Salesforce as an example, you know, Salesforce 
can easily be classified as a CRM system, but you can also extend Salesforce and do a lot of other things within that too. So it, it's not necessarily just to be looked at as a CRM, but um, you, you have, the key point is you have to start somewhere and think about what are, what is the focus area and what are both the things that are most important to you as an organization and the things where it's going to be most differentiating in terms of what system you choose to be able to start from. So um, really looking at that, um, deciding on a foundation and saying this, this is the, kind of the stake we're going to put in about what the what the system needs to do at its core and then the other pieces can be uh, figured out around that because sometimes you may be able to find vendors who can do that stake and then they can also meet the other needs through some of the other products that they have or that integrate well with certain other systems um, so for example working with another client of mine since late last year we started with from the standpoint of we're going to do uh, we want to look at one system, CRM, ERP, and HCM, and all those capabilities into one. And we had some recommendations around that. And uh, before we even got into demos and, and doing some of the analysis, quickly decided that, that you know this wasn't going to this wasn't going to work out with the vendors we were looking at. We weren't going to have any that were going to meet their needs across the board. So we said CRM is the most critical. Everyone in the organization is using CRM. They're uh, really focused on their um, the memberships they have in other organizations that they work with and being able to manage that from a CRM perspective. So we want to start from there, figure out what's most important from a CRM capability standpoint, and then look at how do we how do we layer in the other needs and how are they going to play with that uh, CRM choice from the ERP and HCM perspective. So that's worked out well in this case. We've chosen a CRM. We've, uh, we're getting close to choosing an ERP. We're starting to do HCM demos, and now we have some foundation on which to make those decisions and know that some of the other decisions have been made. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good way to, good way to look at it. And then you, you, you know, if you kind of lead with a, assuming you're looking for technology to replace, you know, most of your enterprise, let's just say, um, you know, there's certainly, there's always going to be cases where an organization, especially if you're a larger organization, you're just looking for a CRM system. You're just looking for, you know, a real specific need. But if you're, if you don't fall into that bucket, you're looking for something more enterprise wide, you know, that's a good rule of thumb. I think that you gave, which is to sort of start with that core, you know, sort of a single ERP first mentality. Like if I can find an ERP system that can do everything that I want, great. Chances are you probably won't find something that can do everything, you know, everything you want the way you want it to, but you could at least start there and then figure out where the gaps are. You, you have one preferred vendor at some point that does the core plus some, and then you figure out where those gaps are. And then you can figure out, okay, do I want to do some bolt-ons or some sort of best of breed model to make it a, you know, a more, a, fit, a, a, a more, a better fit for our organization. Yeah. So and it's deciding if in a certain product category you need the best or if you need something that's just good enough. You know, a good example of this is uh, ERP systems. It's become pretty uh, expected now to have CRM capabilities associated with them, but most of the ERP providers, their CRMs are not going to necessarily compete with the best standalone CRMs from that capability. Um, so deciding, though, if your CRM needs are not as extensive that they, there may be more benefit from just getting the one that that can be connected, even if it's not as fancy or as great as some of the standalone CRMs. That it, it's still going to do more for us by having it connected. But you know, we're a manufacturer and we need to have that uh, manufacturing capability. As just one example, you know, there, there's there's a lot of a lot of different ways. But again, it's that that foundation of what's most important to you and what's going to be most unique to you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So. Um, I didn't tell you I was going to ask ask this question ahead of time, so I apologize in advance for asking. It's, it's, it might be a tough question. We'll see. But um, just, in general, just more than anything, because I'm I'm interested, and maybe the audience might be interested too. But what if you look at some of the clients you've worked with over the last, say, six months or whatever it is, you know, or just working with now? What are just some examples of some of the software vendors that are on the short list or they're being carefully considered by you know the, the the grouping of clients you've worked with over the last amount of time? Not not exhaustive, but just some examples. Sure. And, it, you know, it kind of we'll see some variation based on the type of clients I'm working with. So, for example, I had um, two nonprofits with primarily financial needs. And they, in both cases, those were coming down to a competition of uh, Oracle NetSuite versus Age Intact. And those are both a uh, really good fit for uh, what we needed there. Um, in other cases, um, you know, going through some parallel ones now with some manufacturers as well as some other needs. So we've actually got uh, had a lot of uh, discussion with uh, Infor and Epicor and Acumatica right now. Um, uh, I've been in, in some of the discussions we have. Uh, it can vary too, as I said, in the public sector space. Um, 
you have some some products that are the same. So Oracle ERP Cloud was one of our our shortlist there, but um, in their public sector division. But um, Tyler Munis is a really strong player in the public sector space, so that was one that we saw. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember. I don't want to give short shrift to any of the vendors that I've been working with in some of these projects. Um, Microsoft Dynamics has come up. We've had um, had them come up on quite a few of our projects. I know we've got one of our uh, clients I worked with who's been working with them now. Um, IFS has been showing up uh, and, and some lists. Of, you know, so, you know, it, it really, I, I, to to the point of uh, finding the system that's right for you. There's some other great systems that I haven't mentioned in that list, and it just comes down to the specific needs and fit of the organizations that I've been working with, and then those have been some of the right ones. But, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It's always interesting to hear, you know, talk to different teams on from third stage, just hearing, you know, what what systems we're looking at and what ones clients are considering, which ones they're picking, which ones we're implementing. It's always, uh, it's interesting to see how that evolves over time. Um, so I think a question that's probably on a lot of people's minds is uh, what is the best uh, ERP or enterprise software out there? Do you, do you have a favorite? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, because I, like I said, I would, I really want to, um, the best one, I mean, it depends on who you are as an organization. If you're a massive multinational corporation, heavy manufacturer, all kinds of, I mean, the answer might be just SAP is the answer for us and that's the right software and it may be the most broad and extensive capabilities, but there wouldn't even be under, you know, S4HANA wouldn't even be under consideration for a lot of our clients who would be too complex. Um, we've, um, there, there's systems that, um, you said NetSuite is one that's come up on a lot of ours and NetSuite can be a really good uh, fit for a lot of the ones, particularly those who are, like I said, it came with two of the nonprofits I was working with simultaneously were NetSuite from a financials perspective was uh, in the discussion around that. And, and we've gone to that a lot, but we've had other clients who NetSuite isn't uh, isn't really the right answer for them. Some of them that uh, maybe just the nature of the manufacturing they're doing and the complexity of it, like NetSuite is not a good fit and doesn't, doesn't scale as well as what they need to do. So um, it's, again, I could, <laughs> uh, the, 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 I could weasel out of this and say it's the the best software is for each client the one that we end up picking. You know? But yeah. uh, it, it's true. There's just it, there's a lot of ones with a lot of good capabilities in different areas, and uh, we all, we want to make sure we're looking at the right ones for you. So uh, yeah, that, that can vary quite a bit. I think a lot of people w want to believe that there is a best one out there. We just aren't telling it. There's got to be a <laughs> the best one for everyone, and you're just not telling us <laughs> who it is. But you're right. It's you look at all of our evaluations. We've done this before in the past where because uh, potential clients sometimes will ask, okay, tell us what systems you've evaluated for different clients over the last amount of time and tell us which ones have been recommended. So we've had to go through that exercise in the past and it's, and it's such a broad mix. I mean, you look at uh, mm -hmm. even just the ones that end up getting recommended, it, you can't really find a pattern there. And that's actually what a lot of uh, potential clients wanted, why they asked that question, because they want to make sure that we actually are independent and agnostic and uh, mm -hmm. we are in fact agnostic. So. We don't really really care what system that clients pick as long as it's the best fit for them. And on the flip yeah. side, I know. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to add too. I mean, another example of this is, is Salesforce. Is well, I've worked a lot with Salesforce and been in an organization that was with Salesforce. Got trained, uh, went through some Salesforce training as an admin, helped implement it at a nonprofit I've been volunteering for, and um, had it come up with a lot of the clients that I'm working with. Either they've been uh, using it or interested in using it. And, you know, Salesforce and from a market share perspective is in a really strong space in the CRM more so really than a ERP provider in terms of where they stand above anyone else. But, you know, it's, it's a great CRM tool, but it's also one that um, I've seen it very heavily misused as well. And I've seen organizations try to do everything out of it and treat it as their whole enterprise technology and build a lot of custom stuff on it or try to do things that Salesforce can do, but maybe not do so well. And it can be, very problematic. So I mean, that, I may have worked with that more than more than others, even. But um, and, and definitely, if someone's looking at a CRM, it's it's always in there. But it can be expensive. It can be a tough fit. Like, um, so I, I don't know. Any 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 recommendation of any software, even if it's a great fit for someone, there's always going to be some caveats and some some cautions for you and risks you have to watch out for. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. I I, I like telling clients that, and I, I think it's important for us to always remember to tell clients that that even once you found the system that is the best fit for you, you still want to poke holes in and find where those gaps are. Not because you want to create doubt or not because you want to freak out your internal stakeholders about, you know, problems, but because you need to know what they are, because that's the stuff that drives the implementation mm -hmm. duration and cost and risk ultimately. So I think that's, it's a really good point. 
Um, and I think there's probably a lot of vendors. I know a lot of vendors listen to this show, software vendors and implementers. And I, I bet they're probably strongly disagree with yours and I's opinion that there is no best system out there. <laughs> they're all thinking, no, you were absolutely wrong. Our system is the best. You just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Right. Yeah. So one last question for you uh, before we wrap up here. Um, how how can organizations best get started on their ERP evaluation process? Say they, they recognize the need, they want to consider, or maybe they've already decided that they're going to replace whatever system or systems they have. How, do, how does a company get started? Yeah, well, you know, uh, in the um, interest of, you know, how, how we look at it from third stage and how I look at it and what we be, were able to do for our clients, you know, getting that independent advice is uh, always super valuable and that we're something we're able to offer organizations to be able to, um, not just be able to give that independent advice on the um, the software categories and the types of selections, but also to be able to guide them through a structured process around how you need to capture the requirements and go to the RFP and choose your vendors and be able to do it in a way that we said you're you're managing the pace and doing it in an efficient way. You may have uh, you know large organizations may have some capabilities in some of these areas too to be able to do some of that. So I don't want to say you necessarily need to. You can't do this without third stage. There certainly uh, right. can be can be ways. If it's, for example, the process uh, workshops that we run, a lot of teams have a process specialists who can do that type of thing, and uh, it, we we often can guide you on and give some direction on how, how's the best way to do that in a way that's effective for what your project is. But um, you know, we it, it's really um, and even if. Uh, as you're starting to get into the decision to choose whether it's us or another provider can give you an independent opinion of things to be able to start from the standpoint of talking about it with the right leadership people of design, defining the right folks who need to be engaged in uh, a part of the process and inform them a decision to be able to align on you know what you're trying to get out of it where you hope to go and uh, any of that will be useful like I said we we have a workshop process in which we do this on a project but you should do it before you're you're talking to anyone and have some uh, some people with some common expectations that you're uh, aligning around. Yeah, yeah, and I, one thing I'd add to that is just make sure you're getting some level of agnostic filter in in your evaluation process because you know inherently you know a lot of the stuff you just described, Brian, in, in your responses is is you're relying on the vendors to give you information in, in much of the evaluation, and even in cases where um, you know we're involved, you know we're we're reaching out to vendors we're capturing information from them, but we also bring tools to the table that are agnostic that, you know, again, to your point, even if you don't use third stage, you just want to make sure that you have these tools like this or a way to bring agnostic tools to the table. Like in our case, it's our database that we use to um, map out requirements to different systems to quantitatively look at how well do the systems do these things, not just do they do it or no, it's more how well do they do it. So that's just one example. And then certainly our experience implementing different systems just gives us a you know, agnostic view of the world and the fact that we're not getting compensated by vendors makes us agnostic. So the reason I bring all this up, not necessarily to say you should hire third stage, although I, to be candid, I do think organizations should hire us. But even if you don't, you want to make sure that you have that sort of someone on the team that's agnostic, that has a broad view that can bring that unbiased perspective to the evaluation because so much of the evaluation is already going to be biased as it is because you're, you know, getting RFP responses and demos and things from sales reps that are trying to close you on a, on a deal. So that's, uh, that's, that sound advice. I appreciate you sharing that, and uh, also appreciate you being here today. Thanks for uh, thanks for taking time out of your Friday, and thank you to the audience that participated and asked the great questions. Appreciate that, and uh, yeah, thanks for being here, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I enjoyed the discussion, and thank you to everyone for the questions that you submitted. All right, sounds good. Well, you have a good uh, rest of your Friday. Have a great weekend, everyone, and uh, we'll we'll see you all soon. Uh, every Friday at twelve o'clock, or, or I'm sorry, two p.m. Eastern time in the U.S is when we do these live streams. So I encourage you to, to join us every Friday and uh, listen to our Transformation Ground Control podcast as well, which is where we uh, we actually repackage these interviews and, and uh, release them as part of our weekly uh, Transformation Ground Control podcast, or at least it's one segment on our uh, weekly podcast. So I uh, appreciate everyone being here. And everyone have a great weekend.